Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Randy Stone. I'm so pleased that you're joining us for this fireside chat. We've got a really special guest today, Dr. Kirk Garrett. We're going to talk about heart health and stroke awareness. We're broadcasting live today from the experimental station at the beautiful Innovation Center on the Wilmington campus. We do have a great agenda today. We're going to cover a lot of really important topics. We are going to run Slido today. For those of you that may not be familiar with Slido, the directions are in the upper right-hand corner of the slide. It's really simple. Log into slido.com, put in the event code and the passcode, then you can ask a question. We do hope to leave some time at the end of discussion today for those questions. Before I formally introduce Dr. Garrett, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the work we're doing with the American Heart Association. And I want to specifically acknowledge David Morris and Laura Laurel and the whole board for the AHA for the work that they're doing on heart health. We were approached to be a signature sponsor this year. And for those of you that I've worked with, you know, I'm not all that fond of spending the company's money, but I do love investing it. And this is a great investment. We said, if we're going to do this, we want to tailor some sessions specifically for employees to talk about heart health, to talk about ways to improve our overall physical, mental and emotional health, and we're going to do all of those in concert with the American Heart Association. In May of this year, we're going to do an event on COVID-19 and a lasting impact on the cardiovascular system with Dr. Suzanne Sherman, who leads Integrated Health Services for DuPont. We've got a number of other events that we'll talk about, including mental health and heart disease. We'll talk about specific tips to improve nutrition, physical activity, and heart health. And we'll talk about diversity in heart disease specifically in women. These are going to be great events, but I can't think of a better way to start up our series than by formally welcoming our special guest, Dr. Kirk Garrett. Thanks, it's a real pleasure to be with you today. You know, it's strange, I consider you a good friend, someone I certainly admire, but I guess it's a symbol of the times in COVID. This is the first time we've met face to face in person. That is you know, true. We've been talking every week for about a year now. That's correct. And it is a sign of the times and uh, boy, we're all anxious to have it pass. Yeah, absolutely. We're six feet apart, of course, today is uh, practicing good social distancing. But uh, is this the first time you've been on a DuPont campus? It is. And uh, I was commenting on the way in that uh, the complex looks big from, the, from Powder Mill Road. When you get back into it, you realize it, it is really a spectacular complex here. And I understand the history of this site is, is really rich. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, we've been uh, here since 1802. Uh, DuPont was started on the banks of the Brandywine River and Hagley Museum. It's probably four or five hundred yards away. So mm. we've been here a long time. I don't know what's kept you from coming. You know, we've been here all along. <laughs> so we're, we're glad that you're here today. We've got a really good agenda for today. Hey, before we get into all of the specifics on heart health and the specific medical things, I'm always really interested to hear backgrounds on things. So um, first, in terms of your background, it's, it's fascinating. You're a native of California. Uh, you grew up there, went to school there, but now you're in Delaware. What kind of led you to Delaware? Well, it's one of those classically circuitous routes, I suppose. I, <clears throat> yeah, I was a Los Angelian uh, by birth and by orientation, never really expected I would leave California. I had then an opportunity, though, to go to school at Duke University and uh, seize that opportunity, opened my eyes to uh, what lay east of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, learned a bit about the environment, went back then to UCLA to continue my training, and uh, then had an opportunity to work to train at Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. Frankly, Midwest had never really gone through my mind as a place to live, uh, but certainly I knew about Mayo Clinic. And so I took advantage of that great opportunity for two years to train in interventional cardiology, which was my chosen discipline. Um, I ended up remaining uh, there for the better part of 20 years uh, on staff, um, had an incredible experience there and would still be there had it not been for one of those unexpected turns in life. Uh, a good friend uh, and uh, an incredibly innovative man named Gary Rubin, the inventor of the first coronary stent that was approved for use in uh, in the in the United States. Um, I'd known him at that time for probably 15 years. He invited me to join a practice that he was building in Manhattan. 
at that point, my kids were older and I had freedom to move. And I thought as much as I love being at Mayo, this is one of those opportunities that it was hard to pass. So I took it, uh, then worked uh, with Gary and uh, other luminaries, uh, an amazing team, really a, a kind of a Camelot practice there in Manhattan for 10 years. Then uh, was invited to come to Christiana Care by someone I knew here, Bill Weintraub, uh, to deliver what we call Grand Rounds, which is a sort of a lecture to talk about things that are happening in my, my space. At that time, I was moving my interests a bit. They were evolving, not less interested in the interventional cardiovascular practice, but more interested in the administrative side of, of cardiovascular medicine. And, and so I came and spoke a bit about how the world seemed to be changing uh, as I saw it and the challenges that lay ahead for cardiology. My predecessor, Tim Gardner, a cardiac surgeon who was the director of the Center for Heart and Vascular Health at Christiana Care ahead of me, happened to be uh, in attendance that day. He approached me and said, um, you know, I, I wonder if you might be interested in, in joining our team. Uh, he was at that time looking for a successor. And uh, so here we are, uh, nearly six years later, happy to be a part of the Christiana Care team. Yeah, well, it's Delaware's good fortune. For those who are Following along on today's presentation, you can see in the slides some of the background and some of the things that you've done. But serving 17 years at the Mayo Clinic, uh, part of the team that performed the first minimally invasive heart procedures at Mayo, including laser coronary angioplasty, <coughs> coronary atherectomy, stent implantation, and a number of other things that I probably can't pronounce. It's amazing <laughs> your career, what you've done. Um, when you think about your, field, your chosen field, what inspired you to get into medicine in the first place? You know, um, I, 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 unlike maybe some people who would say, gee, my parents were doctors and my grandparents and I never saw anything ahead of me but medicine, my life was not like that at all. I grew up in East Los Angeles. My father was a diesel mechanic. Um, I was the first in my family to go to college. Uh, so I really had a blank slate. Um, I was interested initially in music. I actually started as a piano major, believe it or not. Uh, quickly learned that uh, there were plenty of people uh, ahead of me. Uh, so I, I just tossed around a bit, frankly, for a couple of years, um, transferred from a small uh, liberal arts school to the University of California, the, the Irvine campus, which is a lesser known UC campus, but is uh, really disciplined in sciences. Uh, so I got an exposure to biology, biochemistry and the like, uh, liked it. So I declared a major in biochemistry, in, uh, in biology. Um, Upon graduation with my bachelor's degree, I matriculated into the PhD program there in, in um, molecular biology and biochemistry. And I probably would be working in one of your buildings here, Randy, if it hadn't been for the fact that my, my laboratory that I worked in, my mentor's location, was attached to the medical school. So I would set up an experiment and I'd have a little time to kill. I'd walk over to the auditorium and listen in on the medicine lectures and thought, well, this is sort of interesting. And, so I, I, I pivoted and, uh, and, and moved over to the medical campus. And uh, after that, uh, just got very interested in cardiology, cardiovascular physiology. And at that time, this idea of using catheters to open up blockages in heart arteries was all very new. Uh, you know, that was, I, I was, my timing couldn't have been better. I was right at the inception there. Uh, and uh, I had a, some great breaks to work with me, uh, brilliant mentors and open doors. Well, we're certainly going to talk about heart issues. That's the foundation of what we're doing today. But it's also interesting to hear about leadership for DuPont employees or family members or others that are that are listening in too. Um, you know, we talked a little bit before. Uh, you know, when you go through this path, there can be struggles at times. You know, these these careers are challenging regardless of what you do. Uh, talk a little bit about were there times when you were in school or just starting? You said, "Boy, am I in the right place? Am I going to be able to make it?" Well, sure. Um... You know, I, um, as I tell, tell my tale, you might think, well, he's a very bright guy. Clearly, he just, you know, had all the grit to, to kind of uh, do what needed to get done. Uh, I wish it were so. Uh, uh, like many people, I think, who uh, find themselves in leadership positions, I reflect back and realize that probably the steps that I've made that have been the most important in my career development have been rooted in acknowledging where I was weakest mm -hmm. and trying hard to kind of fill that gap. Uh, and it started back in the college years. Um, I, I was not the smartest kid on the block. I was not 
not the best piano major. I was certainly not yeah. the best biology student, um, but I, I recognize that uh, you know the hard work and uh, resilience will go a long way. And so I just kind of bit down hard and uh, and did what needed to get done to kind of drive the drive the learning forward. I can remember having a lot of painful moments when I would uh, look at upcoming uh, mathematics examinations. Yeah. Uh, mathematics remains my, <laughs> my great Achilles heel and uh, nearly kept me uh, out, frankly. Yeah. I mean, uh, not, not that I was failing, but I just, uh, you know, you need to, you need to have a, a scorecard that looks pretty good right. to get into medical school. And uh, that, was a, that was a weakness I had to overcome. Yeah. We have so many brilliant scientists and uh, STEM majors here in DuPont, but it's yeah. a struggle for a lot of people. We have something in common. I'm the first in my family to go to college as yeah. well, too. And you do have doubts. You're not sure, hey, am I going to yeah. be able to do this thing? But you kind of stay curious. You stay active. You surround yourself with really great people and you can make some good things happen. So hey, we're going to transition a little bit and talk about some of the medical issues you're going to see pretty quickly. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about medicine. I'm no Oprah Winfrey when it comes to interviewing as well, too. So this is probably my one big moment to talk to someone really important in an interview. But let's go through and talk about some things. Obviously, COVID has just dominated everything, and rightly so the last year. You know, just in the U.S., I think over 500 deaths from COVID. Uh, but what people may not know is that typically heart disease and stroke are number one in terms mm. of uh, killers in the U.S. and stroke, I think, is four or five, depending on the state. Yeah. Maybe talk about those <clears throat> statistics. Why is heart disease so prevalent? You're right. Uh, the COVID 2020 was a you know an odd year, and COVID uh, kind of took the lead position in terms of cause of death. Uh, tragic, and we're all eager to see that pass. But when that when the smoke clears from that, we'll be back to facing the reality that cancer and cardiovascular disease are are our main challenges in terms of American mortality. Not to minimize, by the way, the, 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 the importance of chronic lung disease, um, opioid um, complications, yep. um, and be, the, the importance of behavioral health, which I would be happy to touch on in the context of cardiovascular care. But in the larger context, of course, depression, suicide, uh, has, uh, of course, been also very yeah. important as background as well as during the pandemic years. Why is heart disease such a problem in America? Well, it's, it's a hard thing to admit, but the truth is after decades and decades of research, uh, we still don't really know the answer to that very fundamental question. We do know if you if you go back and examine um, mummies uh, from five or six thousand years ago, um, there are signs of atherosclerotic disease in those preserved cadavers. Uh, so this is not something brand new. We also know that um, autopsies of young children that die in accidents and the like, um, uh, in America at least, um, show the early changes in blood vessel blood vessel structure mm -hmm. that we we understand as a kind of a precursor state for the development of this atherosclerosis. Big name just means basically diseased arteries right. that choke up with the cholesterol plaque. Uh, a big study back in the 60s during the Vietnam War era um, reported out on a very high prevalence of these early plaques in the arteries of young men uh, killed during that war. We've come to understand over the past five decades an awful lot about what drives the disease. The fundamental triggers of the disease, though, are still a little less apparent. Certainly, your genetic makeup has a lot to right. do with it. It's been difficult to tease that apart. What genetic features actually make you start those early plaque changes in your blood vessels as opposed to those that mm -hmm. drive their more rapid and full development. Uh, that's been a little bit of a challenge. But what we what we do understand is that lipids play a really central role here and lipids is sort of the big title for cholesterol and triglycerides and all the fatty things that circulate and build up in the plaque. It plays a really central role. That learning back in the hmm, 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s led um, agencies like the American Heart Association and, and government uh, health agencies to make these declarations that, gee, we really need to be pursuing low fat diets. Mm -hmm. That's going to be very important. At the time, it made abundant sense. What we have learned since is life is not that simple. And yes, containing lipids in your diet and managing that is an important step, but there's there's much more at play. Right 
probably most famously the carbohydrate story, yeah. uh, which we all recognize now uh, that uh, the carbohydrate lipid interaction is really mm-hmm. appears to be um, very, very important in at least the driving of this atherosclerotic disease process. And that triggers those events like strokes and heart attacks right. that we're trying to avoid. You mentioned cholesterol and um, talk a little bit about these class of statins. They're mm. everywhere, right? And a lot of people take them. Have they generally been effective? <clears throat> yeah, I'm sure you recommend them a lot for most people. Are they, if you have high cholesterol, is that something as a cardiologist you recommend to your patients? If you ask a cardiologist if you need a statin, it's a little bit like asking the Pope if a if prayer is a good idea. Uh, here is the fact. Yeah. The class of drugs that we refer to as statin drugs are unequivocally the most important, most powerful, most impactful cardiovascular medicines ever developed, Hmm. period. These pills have the ability to lower your risk of a stroke or a heart attack by 50 to 80 percent depending on where you fall in that risk strata. But even if you're low risk for these events, you still get benefit. We can still drive down your risk. Now, yes, in the early going, um, the early versions of these medicines were less refined, less perfected. That means they were linked to a greater prevalence of side effects. Mm -hmm. And the side effects were not pleasant. Mm -hmm. Muscle aches and problems, some of which could be quite severe. There were liver concerns, there were kidney concerns. It is true that only a small number of people suffered from those complications, but those that did suffered badly. And that got a lot of press. So I would say for a period of time, statins were sort of America's favorite drug to hate. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a challenge in clinical practice to convince people, particularly people at very high risk, to take the medicines. Today, it's gotten much easier. The medicines are are more refined. They're more perfected. We have many more choices. If I give you a statin pill and you you don't tolerate it, I can reach over and get another right away. We've got many to choose from. I would also add, Randy, Mm -hmm. that we have now additional classes of medication, which may in a future time, if I'm back in this chair in 20 years, I may say to you, here's the class of medicine that's been most impactful on cardiovascular health. And and what I'm specifically thinking about are these newer drugs that work through a completely, in a completely different way from the statin drugs, but which really drive down your blood cholesterol levels and have been linked to very big reductions in stroke and heart attack risk. These medicines are a little more complicated. Some of them have to be injected, Mm -hmm. uh, but the side effect profile is um, is brilliant. There's, mm-hmm. there's, they're not perfect. No medicine is completely 100% free of any possible side effect, but these medicines have been uh, really, really uh, well tolerated and uh, highly, highly effective. Yeah. For someone like me or maybe the people that are watching in, um, kind of defining what heart disease is, what cardiovascular disease is, what is the marker? How do you know when you have heart disease? You know, the sad truth is if you're, if you're an American living a classic American life, eating a typical American diet, you're at risk. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that we believe is part of the, the reason that heart disease remains um, sadly in the, as a front runner in, in uh, the cause of death in America. Mm-hmm. So we have, to be, we have to be vigilant. We have to, we have to work hard to um, identify ways that we can adjust our behaviors that are, that are palatable and, and that people can adhere to, uh, those things will uh, drive down mm-hmm. uh, drive down the risk of, of bad things happening from heart and vascular disease. This involves some um, discipline around how we eat, mm-hmm. um, increasing our level of activity, uh, and refraining from some things that may be very pleasant but have terrible health consequences. Right. Tobacco smoking would yeah. be the most obvious. Yeah. So if you think about, there are certain, you know, congenital things that we can't really change our genetics, of course, but on the behavioral side, if you had to kind of Pareto and say, hey, what's most important? Would you say if you're a smoker, that's probably the most important thing to stop first? Then you would look at diet, exercise, other lifestyles, sleep, rest, mental health, all those things. So how do you do that when a patient comes in who's in moderately good health, for example? Mm -hmm. How do you go about 
diagnosing and telling people, hey, this is this is your path to better heart health. Right. So people will come in typically for, for one of two or three reasons. Uh, some people just want to come in and have an assessment because their uncle died of a heart attack right. at age 65 and they want to make sure they're okay. Uh, that's great because it gives us an opportunity then to sort of do a full evaluation, try to assess where they are in that spectrum of risk and focus then therapies appropriately. Um, others don't come to attention until something happens. Mm -hmm. That's uh, obviously less less attractive. A, they've had something happen now, right. which might be irreversible. And B, it speaks to their being further along in their journey with atherosclerosis. And like most diseases, the earlier we can intervene, the better the outcomes. So um, I, I guess my, my general global advice uh, for folks is not to race out and see a cardiologist, mm -hmm. but rather make sure you have conversations with your primary care providers about what your risk uh, profile might be. Um, your primary care doctor is able to uh, engage you in that conversation and help define what you might need, help you decide whether you need to see a cardiologist or if there are some intervening steps that could be taken to keep you safe without having to um, uh, kind of plug you into a cardiovascular care. And when you're visiting your primary care physician, they're doing blood work and they can tell you you're cholesterol and all those things. And those are the markers that say, hey, you might need to go see a cardiologist, you know, someone my age or in their 40s, for example. At what point do you say, hey, it's not enough just to go to my primary care physician. Maybe I should on a proactive basis see a cardiologist. <clears throat> should people do that or do they just stay with their primary care physician until they see some markers that say, hey, you might want to think about doing something extra? You know, Randy, as much as it seems to make sense that, golly, I'm 40, I'm 50, I'm 60, what have you, I'm I'm going to go get a check, you know, and just uh, seems like the right time. That strategy is probably not optimal um, for, for a lot of reasons. We need to um, rely on the strength of the primary care teams to drive and steer your, your health care. Uh, now, part of that is, is just more efficient. So in terms of the, you know, spiraling healthcare costs in right. America and how do we get ahead of it? Well, the truth is part of the answer is we use things like specialty care, which are generally more expensive, um, sensibly. We don't withhold them from people who need them, but we, we don't want to just toss them at folks right. when there's not likely to be a, a large uh, return on that. Um, secondly, it's become increasingly clear that the, the real secret to, to keeping America's, Americans healthy, especially in the context of things like atherosclerotic heart disease, is not generating a, a new crop of highly skilled interventional cardiologists uh, like I considered myself yeah. once upon a time who can get in there and stop your heart attack and pull you back from the flames. That's needed but that's not really where we should be investing. We should be investing our energies, our resources in developing that army of frontline providers, your primary care team that can do the right things to assess your risk and address it. If that means pulling you into the office of a cardiologist, terrific. If it doesn't require that, no need to force it. Yeah. Hey, one of the negative consequences of COVID is that we see people going to the doctor less they're concerned we've seen it inside the dupont company we actually saw you know during the second quarter of last year in the third quarter our medical expenses were down because people were yeah. not going for elective procedures or not going to see the the doctor has that had an impact do you see that firsthand is there data that says hey we're seeing more heart disease and more heart attacks and that things that could have been prevented uh sadly yes uh, during the peak of the pandemic, uh, at, at Christiana Care, for example, um, in the months of, say, between the middle of March and middle of May, mm -hmm. during that period, we saw as much as a 50% reduction in emergency department visits for things like strokes and heart attacks. Well, listen, there's, there's nothing about a pandemic that should make the risk of stroke and heart attack go down. If anything, pressure on your job, life changes, all, all the things that came with the pandemic increased stress, increased anxiety. We know those are triggering events for strokes and heart attacks. So we were very worried that people were simply avoiding care because they were afraid to go to a hospital. Mm -hmm. They thought they'd get COVID-19 disease if they did. Um, and unfortunately now we've got data 
through government statistics and reports from large healthcare organizations that confirm our fears. People, in fact, were delaying care and they were suffering then serious events at home, unattended. Um, a heart attack, for example, can present classically the crushing chest pain in the arm and the sweats and so on. You call for help, you get rushed in the hospital, we take care of you. And today we can, in almost all cases, we can abort that heart attack, stop the process, not just save your life, but preserve your heart function. It's very time dependent though. And, and if you allow that to go, the heart is injured irreversibly and some people with that process will just die. They just drop dead. We call that sudden cardiac death. Mm -hmm. Our rates of sudden cardiac death during 2002 soared nationally as well as regionally. Mm -hmm. And we, we, it's a little hard to be completely certain, I right. suppose. But if you connect the dots, it looks like people were afraid to get the care they needed and they had immediate devastating consequences. Same story in stroke and other non-cardiovascular diseases. Yeah. You, you mentioned the time component. Uh, when we announced that we were doing this event, I got a great email from a guy named Greg Westbrook who works at one of our sites in Washington Works and told a story that they saw someone on video who showed signs of like slurred speech a little bit mm. and something was off just a little bit mm. and they encouraged the employee, they went in. But the importance of that first few minutes, if you're feeling symptoms or you see a colleague, a family member, those first few minutes are really important, aren't they? The first hour is what we refer to as the golden hour. <clears throat> if you're having a stroke, if you're having a heart attack, if we can get you to proper care and treat you within that first hour, you're almost guaranteed that you will have minimal or no uh, enduring consequence from, from that event. Unfortunately, every minute that passes, the odds of that outcome go down. Mm -hmm. um, and um, certainly, if too much time has passed, um, no matter how wonderful the healthcare you receive mm -hmm. uh, may be, uh, irreversible injury uh, results, and that, that results yeah. in then a stroke with weakness that's permanent and speech impediments that are permanent. It results in heart attacks that leave you disabled uh, or are not able to resume all the activities you would you would have enjoyed previously. Um, we are anticipating and predicting now in 2021 that um, we'll see the need for much more heart failure care. Mm -hmm. Because some of those people that delayed care uh, didn't die happily, but their hearts were injured in a way that will result in impaired heart pumping action. Mm -hmm. That creates the the clinical setting that we refer to as heart failure, uh, and uh, that requires a lot of care. So the message that I'm hearing, if you're watching this video and you see someone, a family member, a friend, a colleague who's showing signs of symptoms or doesn't feel quite right, don't wait. Don't wait. Act don't, quickly and urgently. Don't delay care. And, and I'll just add to that important message, Randy, that it's worth remembering that hospitals, clinics, healthcare facilities have been in the business of managing people with infectious disease for a century or more. We, we know how to do it very well, very effectively, very safely. There is really no reason at all to worry that going to get care you need is going to expose you to um, uh, an important risk right. of acquiring COVID-19. Yeah. Tell me, um, is a heart attack and cardiac arrest, is it the same thing? Are they different? I should know this by this age, but I don't. <laughs> I'm almost embarrassed to admit that, but help me understand that. Sure. I, I think uh, to kind of in the, 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 the lay terms, the lay language, uh, they're, they're, they seem somewhat synonymous. Um, in, within medicine, we, we try to kind of differentiate the language a little bit so that we're clear when we alert teams to, of, of, a, of a problem, right. they come prepared to, to take the right actions. So um, a heart attack, what we refer to in medical language as a myocardial infarction, is an injury of the heart muscle. Um, that's just what it sounds like. It's some part of heart muscle that is being damaged. Usually it's being damaged because a blocked heart artery has has suddenly stopped the blood flow into a part of the heart muscle and that heart muscle can't get along without blood and oxygen just like the rest of your body parts. Um, heart muscle and brain are, are, are um, 
very, very sensitive to blood flow reduction so that your, your leg, for example, can sustain an impaired blood flow for hours and you'll get through that okay, but not with heart and brain. Mm -hmm. So the heart attack process in America, usually a blocked heart artery results in heart muscle injury. We can go in and open that blockage through a number of means, restore flow, stop the process. Great. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, a cardiac arrest or, a, you know, a, a, a cardiac arrest event mm -hmm. in, in medical terms refers to uh, uh, an irregularity in the heart rhythm, the electrical mm -hmm. behavior of the heart that causes the heart function to stop. Mm -hmm. um, that is often triggered by a heart attack. The okay. myocardial injury process yep. can trigger a sudden arrest, uh, but it needn't be that you can have cardiac arrest for other reasons. And, and that's why inside the hospital, when we hear one or the other, we come with a certain set of tools and bring the right skills to the bedside to make sure we're prepared to address it. Yeah. Are the symptoms for men and women different for the warning signs of a heart attack? Are they exactly the same? What are the risk factors? Uh, what, and what are those types of differences that you see in your practice? Yeah, well, I'll address the symptom piece first. Uh, that it's, I think, pretty well known now that women um, can have a much different presentation than than men. And uh, the, the sad truth is that the classic symptoms that cause all of us to say there's a heart attack happening, the, you know, the chest pain, as I mentioned earlier, often radiating down one or the other arm up into the jaw, the neck, sweatiness, difficulty breathing, fatigue. Yes, women can present with those classic symptoms for sure, and that's great because we can zero in on the diagnosis quickly. Randy, you, uh, you wouldn't believe some of the stories I've heard of, of uh, and, and some of the things I've witnessed mm -hmm. uh, about the symptoms that, that women present with that are, are so confusing that they can delay the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember a woman that I cared for um, whose main complaint was that she felt like there was a bag of ice on the top of her head. Okay. So to get from that complaint yeah. to heart attack is a challenge. Uh, now, in order to address that, of course, uh, our frontline providers in the emergency departments and so forth are A, alerted to the fact that women present uh, differently than men often with, with these problems. And B, um, as a team, they're astute enough to, to dig deeper. You know, can check, uh, no, no bag of ice on your head. Let's think about what else that might right. be. Uh, so um, happily, most of the time, it doesn't delay treatment too badly. But uh, I, I think the, the root of your yeah. question, uh, the answer is, yes, women can present with a variety of different um, atypical symptoms, how we refer to them. And we have to remain vigilant then as a healthcare team to, to look through it and uh, think, go through the checklist of yeah. what might this be that could have devastating early consequences. Let's exclude that right away and then we can kind of go down the list. One, one of the things I've learned the last year being part of the American Heart Association team is that, boy, it doesn't <clears throat> discriminate on age either. We mm. have so many cases of younger people that we've heard about and some of the success stories that are amazing that uh, you know i always think about heart attack and heart disease that's something that happens as you progress in age but there are many cases where it can impact younger adults or even pre-adults there's good news and not so good news uh there um the good news is that um although heart and cancer are the the front runners and they, they sort of go nose to nose every year in, in different regions, what's more, more deadly. Um, the good news is that for both of those, we're, we're seeing great success. Mm -hmm. We're seeing great success. We are driving down those mortality rates. Uh, and that's thanks in large part, by the way, to the work of agencies like the American Heart Association yeah. that fund the research needed to, to learn how to do a better job. Um, that's the good news. Um, I'll just share that your, your odds of having a heart attack um, compared to your odds 20 years ago or so, half. Wow. Half, Randy. You are half as likely to have a heart attack today as you would have been in the later part of the 20th century. Furthermore, if you had a heart attack, your odds of surviving it are better than 90%, probably better than 95%. Mm -hmm. Your father, your grandfather with that same heart attack would have had maybe one chance, uh, six chances out of 10, something mm -hmm. like that, about 60% survival. So with huge gains. So that's the good news. The bad news is that it remains the leading cause right. of death. And we are seeing more and more events in young people 
frankly, some of that is tied into the things we talked about before with genetic predisposition and some unusual genetic mm -hmm. profiles that make people highly susceptible. Um, that's an area of incredibly active and interesting research today. Some of these new genetic uh, editing technologies yeah. uh, have promise of changing the uh, the future for people with those sort of disorders, as do some of the medications that I, I touched on. Part of it, though, is behavioral. And uh, we all know that um, exposure to certain toxins in the environment, <clears throat> including um, some recreational drugs that might be taken, um, have direct toxic effects on blood vessels and can trigger blood vessel anomalies that can lead to things like strokes and heart attacks. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about stroke? Are the What are the warning signs mm. of stroke? We've talked a lot about yeah. heart disease and heart attacks yeah. and so forth, but if someone is having a stroke, are there typical symptoms that they feel and triggers that say, hey, something's abnormal here. I got to get to an emergency room quickly. It's it's really analogous to what we talked about with heart attacks, Randy. The um, There are classic symptoms and then behind that is a universe of possible symptoms. So remember, a stroke means that there's just like, just analogous with the heart and a heart attack, myocardial infarction means injury to heart muscle. A stroke means injury to brain tissue. Mm -hmm. What part of the brain is injured is very important in predicting or determining what kind of sign you might or symptom you might have as a result of that. Because certain blood vessels in the, the brain artery network mm -hmm are most likely to have a plaque buildup and a blood clot form and and, uh, and and trigger a stroke that way. Because we we know certain blood vessels are most likely to have that problem, um, we see certain types of symptoms most often. And those are what we refer to as the classic symptoms. And they are the things that most people probably imagine when they think of somebody who's had a stroke. Difficulty with uh, facial drooping, so right. one part, side of the face not performing properly, difficulty with speech, difficulty with mobility in an arm or a leg or both, almost always just on one side of the body, difficulty with confusion and, and, and thinking. Uh, when when any anyone has the sort of symptoms that, as you described in that, that video encounter, uh, that looks like it could be related to that, you want to you want to immediately get medical evaluation. You know, hopefully it'll be nothing. It'll be a false alarm. That'd be great. But if this is a stroke, we have the ability to arrest that process and preserve brain tissue. And uh, once gone, it's not coming back. So really, really important to act quickly. And how do you arrest that process if someone comes in? Right. How do you treat that? Well, again, there's great, great uh, kind of symmetry here. Going back a few years, back into the 60s, we developed these drugs that were the clot busters. They give you a shot of this stuff if you're having a heart attack, knowing that the heart attack was probably the result of a blood clot forming in a heart artery. This medicine would get in there, dissolve the clot, and restore blood flow. Following that, we learned that we could do an even better job if we trained people to go into an artery in a leg or the wrist, thread a catheter into that heart artery, find the clot, and then disrupt it or destroy it with a variety of different devices. Exactly the same happens in the brain. Um, throughout America, um, virtually every emergency department is prepared to give you the clot busting drug if you present with a, a stroke of the right type. Um, a few centers in America also have the ability to put a catheter in a leg artery or a wrist artery and get up into your brain, okay. find that clot, take it out, destroy it, resolve it, mm -hmm. and stop the process. We at Christiana Care are happy to have that type of stroke center and uh, the results are, are truly um, incredible. That's great. For if you wanna do preventive maintenance work to try to make sure that, hey, you're doing everything you can to prevent stroke. Is it the same as it is for heart health? So, hey, a good diet, exercise, not smoking. Is it exactly the same protocol? It's the same disease. Yeah. It, it is, uh, there, again, there's a lot of different things that can cause a heart attack, a lot that can cause a stroke, but the, the big fish is this atherosclerosis disease. Mm -hmm. And what we talked about before, the, the diet, the exercise, the tobacco and so forth, the cholesterol, that's all aimed at 
at stopping the, the development and progression of atherosclerosis. It's atherosclerosis that causes most heart attacks in America. It's what causes most strokes in America. So the big payoff for folks is to follow those simple and oft repeated rules in right. life about how to maintain your heart and stroke, um, heart and brain health. Hey, we're gonna talk in a future session in May about COVID and the impacts on on heart health, but obviously a lot of people right now are talking about getting the vaccine because this is the time. And so, so what do you tell someone who has maybe got a history of heart disease or who doesn't? Mm -hmm. What are your general feelings about the vaccine and the, the role that it's going to play? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll preamble it by saying that <clears throat> although the, the COVID-19 germ is deadly in lots of different ways, it's worth noting that many of the people who die or have enduring disability from COVID-19 suffer cardiovascular injury as a result of this virus. It's a somewhat less discussed topic, but um, th that is that is a, a true statement. And we're now seeing what we call the long haulers who have right. not just respiratory uh, um, problems, but they have cardiovascular problems as a consequence of their COVID-19 illness. Um, so the cardiology uh, community, uh, I, I think pretty uniformly yeah. is going to say, look, you don't want to get this sickness. It could kill you, or if it doesn't, it could limit your ability to function in life. You want the protection these vaccines can offer. Mm -hmm. and, and I completely understand. We, In the medical community, we're all dazzled at the fact that we've been able to create multiple effective and safe vaccines in such a short period of time. It just yeah. seems like, are we sure we didn't cut a corner on that? Right. Uh, I'm not the expert here, but I can tell you I've reviewed these processes and followed them closely over the past 16 months. And um, I am completely confident that these are as safe and effective as claimed. Mm -hmm. um, I was pushing my way to the front of the line yeah. when it came my turn to get the shot. And I would encourage everyone else to do the same. Yeah. Well, we, we still have four children, high school age and younger at home. And so my wife and I, we have to get out of the house. We're getting that shot. So I was happy to hear your endorsement too, but we're, yeah. we're happy to see the rollout. It's been a little slow getting yeah. started, but I see there's a more aggressive timeline uh, that I just read about too. So I think that'll have a big impact as well too. Talk about the uh, kind of the role of high blood pressure on heart disease. Mm. What about the role of stress in our lives uh, with respect to heart <clears throat> disease and stroke? How do you think about that? You know, when you're, when you're tackling a complex thing like atherosclerosis, what you really would love to do is try to drill down to kind of the root cause, right? Mm -hmm. And if you could get down there, it's like going upstream to find who's throwing the kids in the right. river, you know, that old fable. Um, and, and blood pressure um, turns out to be a pretty good candidate mm -hmm. for kind of root cause intervention to stop a panoply of cardiovascular ailments. Um, hypertension um, is behind many of the heart attacks, many of the strokes that occur in America. It's also behind much of the kidney failure in America and lots of the devastating, what we call peripheral vascular disease that causes people to lose their ability to walk, develop um, unhealing or uh, ulcers and sores on their legs that won't heal, that can lead to amputations and the like. Irregular heart rhythms, the list goes on and on. And I could go into detail about how that happens, but if you accept that what I've just said is, is true, you can imagine then how excited medical uh, providers are if they see opportunities to interrupt hypertension, which is, is, sounds like an easy task, but is actually a very complicated one. Um, I'm not sure how much detail you want to go into here, Randy, but I can tell you that hypertension comes in a lot of different forms. You and I mo both might have high blood pressure for different reasons, different drivers. We require different medical approaches, um, different medications. Uh, African-American communities, for example, have a different form of hypertension, if you will, relative to white populations. In broad, I'm speaking in generalities now. We have to know that as cardiovascular and primary care providers in order to assure we deliver the right, right care recommendations up front. There are newer technologies under development that hold the promise of helping us do a better job of managing blood pressures and keeping them in the right range with fewer and fewer pills. 
uh, that's still sort of work that we're doing, yep. but we're pretty excited about uh, what the future holds there. Mm -hmm. We have, um, as, an, as an, an organization to Christianity Care, um, been speaking very publicly about our commitment to driving down uncontrolled hypertension in our community. And uh, you, you mentioned the work that the AHA right. is doing. As you know, they're, they're very uh, um, excited about a new initiative to try to profile uh, the importance of blood pressure management and steer folks to proper care to make sure their blood pressure is I think controlled. I heard in one of the meetings through AHA that uh, hypertension in Delaware, as an example, at 40 or 50 percent of the population. Is that right? It's that high? So there's a there's a, um, a kind of a think tank group in medical circles called the um, Joint National Council on Hypertension, and they put out a missive every four or five, three or four years, something like that. One of their big kind of summary statements of the state of the world with regard to hypertension going back a few years had the most shocking statement in its preamble. The statement was, if you are a 50-year-old Caucasian man living in America with normal blood pressure, your odds of developing hypertension before you die are 80%. Wow. This is a near uniform disorder in America now. Uh, and again, some of those behavioral things we've talked about are playing a role. We all know people are getting heavier. They're more sedentary, less active dietary indiscretions, those things contribute to this growing, slow, insidious epidemic of hypertension. And, you know, the old saw about hypertension, it's the silent killer. You feel fine, you know, nothing wrong with me. All the time, you know, your body is sort of being ravaged by the hypertension. Uh, we're, we are collectively, and, and again at Christianic Care, trying to be um, and creative about how we can get out into the community, mm -hmm. sample people's blood pressure so that we can see, you know, you look fine, you look healthy, you're lean, right. you, you know, you look fit, I put a blood pressure cuff on you and find out your blood pressure is out of control. Mm -hmm. If we could do that, it gives us an opportunity again to intervene at an early point in the, in the process hopefully stave off any of those bad events. And as you mentioned, it's one of the goals of the American Heart Association this year is to do work in that area. You know, we saw it, at least it seemed anecdotally as we went through COVID, more people were, because we were home, we were going out for walks more. Every time you went to a walking trail, it seemed mm -hmm. more people were out there. But as we kind of enter the spring and summer months, it sounds like physical activity is really essential for both our disease and stroke that getting out and exercising. How much do you recommend for someone? Is it a brisk walk? Is it more vigorous exercise? What do you tell patients who come to see you? Yeah, well, I want to, again, a bit of a disclosure here. Um, please confer with your primary care provider before you engage in any new vigorous activity program to make sure it's safe for you. Uh, the answer to your question is, um, is, is exercise important? It, there, uh, honestly, it, it's, it's as close to magic mm -hmm. as I have seen in my life. There is really something nearly magical about exercise. You, you got to remember, we're, 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 we're fundamentally animals. We're, we're meant to be chasing down our dinner at night, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, but that's not how humans behave. And um, the more we move away from that active lifestyle, our metabolism, which is tuned and designed for that kind of lifestyle, mm -hmm. goes increasingly out of whack. It, and it doesn't take a commitment to run marathons to get it back on track. Mm -hmm. Just moderate exercise, we now know, goes an awfully long way in reducing your risk of hypertension and all that follows. Independent of the hypertension impact, it reduces your risk of heart attack and stroke by improving your metabolic management of things like cholesterol mm -hmm. that contribute to the plaque buildup. We now know outside of heart and vascular, just moderate exercise reduces your risk of a whole laundry list of cancers and other dreadful kind of disorders that are all tethered back to this metabolic mismanagement, if you will. Yeah. How much exercise do you need to do? If you're fit and you don't have limiting medical concerns, the, the, the recommendation is that you engage in 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity per week. Mm -hmm. 
So that's, you know, I mean, that's yeah. not nothing. That's a, that's a that's kind a of, that's a commitment. But remember, that means you take a, a 30 minute walk five days a week. Okay. I, you know, when you put it in those terms, it's a little easier to right. sort of en envision how you would get that done. If you engage in more taxing exercise that really gets you going, uh, you can reduce the number of minutes per week and still attract maximal benefit. How much is a lot of, of activity? There are a lot of different formulas you could right. use to kind of aim at that, but a, a handy one is uh, to, to imagine your um, maximum uh, possible heart rate, the fastest you could get your heart to go is going to be equivalent to roughly the number 220 yeah. minus your, your age. age. You probably heard yep. that, right? Sure. So if you take 80% of that number, if you can hit that number and sustain it for 20 minutes, mm -hmm. if you do that even two or three times a week, um, you will enjoy incredible benefit. Yeah, it's great to hear you say that. You know, within DuPont, we hear a lot of examples of stress and balance because people are working from mm, home and yeah. you know, your work life can bleed into your home life. Mm. Obviously that eliminates the commute, but for those watching, we encourage you to take time to exercise. It's a great investment in your health. It's mm -hmm. great for the company as well too. Mm. Um, we're gonna get to a couple of questions on Slido. Before we do that, are there any kind of summary things that you'd say, hey, if the, the main takeaway from today with respect to heart health <laughs> and stroke, follow these things, what, what advice would you give yeah, yeah, thanks, Randy. I guess the top message I'd want to leave with people is to remain connected to your care provider team mm -hmm. uh, for heart and vascular health, for sure. But across the board, um, we're, we're, it's so painful to see people coming in now uh, with much more advanced disability and injury as a consequence of having failed to maintain their health uh, during the past uh, year or so. Uh, and, and sadly, without cause, there really is no reason to be afraid of, of going to see your doctor, going to see your care provider. And certainly there is no reason to avoid urgent care if you require it. Yep. We're going to go to a couple of questions on Slido. Uh, this is a great one. I'll just read it out for people who are not following. It says, can you reverse the clogging of arteries with diet and what diet do you recommend? Mm -hmm. Um, so I have to be a little careful here because, you know, the, you, everybody's heard the rampaging yeah. debates. The, the one thing I will say is these, these notions that we can develop sort of a, a biological um, cleansing agent that we inject in and it'll dissolve the plaque, that's a no-go. That's been okay. tested. The, there was something called chelation therapy yeah. that kind of had a play for a while. Um, and it, it actually has some benefits. I'm not poo-pooing it altogether. But in, uh, the idea that you could get chelation therapy and it would dissolve your plaques has been well tested and is, is, it unfortunately doesn't work. What does work is diet modification to reduce those um, elements that we know drive atherosclerosis. Classically, high carbohydrate, combined with high lipid um, mm -hmm. in tandem. As, our, as we best understand today, it'll change in the future. Yeah. Um, that um, combined with um, activity. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, what happens is the plaques in your arteries don't shrink down, but they stabilize. Now they do shrink down on a microscopic level. We can take out those artery segments from experimental animals and autopsies, and we can see evidence of that. It does shrink down but it's a it's a fraction of you know of a percent it's not important in that regard but remember the plaques don't just sort of build up slowly and then suddenly like your drain you know just mm -hmm. stops working one day doesn't work like that these plaques will grow to a certain level and then for reasons that are complex the surface will get eroded or, or irritated and that it will trigger a blood clot and that stops the blood flow right now yep. heart attack or stroke we stabilize those plaques so that that erosion process is inhibited and that greatly reduces stroke and heart attack risk. Okay, thank you. Another great question. I understand that women's symptoms of heart attack are different. How so, please? Yeah, we touched on that a little bit. Um, we can see uh, all kinds of different presentations. Um, I guess the, the only thing I can say is that women t are much less likely to come in with those kind of classic traditional yeah. symptoms that cause everyone to say heart attack, let's get going. Instead, we have to peel back the layers a bit. Women are far more likely to present with discomfort that is less, less centered in the center of their chest. It tends to be a little bit lower when they have chest pain. 
And that's problematic because we start thinking about all the belly things that can cause people right. to come into an emergency room and diverts us. They're much less likely to come in with the classic jaw and arm radiating pain. They tend to have a little more pain kind of up in the neck and the head, less in the jaw. And they often come in with little more than complaints of fatigue and a bit of breathlessness. Mm -hmm. Well, the list of things that can cause fatigue in someone is pretty long. Uh, so again, our strategy is to try to see through all that, exclude heart attack, exclude stroke as a presenting, uh, as a cause for the presenting symptoms, and then we can dig down further. Great. Our next question is, oh, this is a good one. Do you have an opinion on the Cato diet and heart disease? Yeah, um, I, I'm not an expert in this, so I, I, I want to be, again, uh, I want to have full disclosure on that. So the keto diet is, uh, what I can tell you, what I do know, is the keto diet is an attempt to get back to a much more fundamental type of approach to food, much less processed, much less combined. And when I mean processed, yes, processed as in packaged and put on a shelf in a grocery store or the microwave. But also, you just think about this now. We, If you go to home and have dinner tonight, you're probably going to have, let's say, nice lean chicken. But it's probably not just chicken. It's probably chicken that's in a sauce with some veggies around it and so forth. Delicious. And for the most part, healthy. The question to be asked is, well, what if you peel that back, though? And what if you just had the chicken and then just had the veggies in their more kind of primitive and original form, right. if you will, can that provide health benefits? Uh, I think the jury is still out a little bit. And again, I'm not an expert, so I want to want to make sure that's that's clear. OK, uh, I have a question from Kim Clark. Thank you for your question. It says, can you explain a mini stroke mm. versus stroke? And if someone had a mini stroke, does that mean a full blown stroke is imminent? Right. So a mini stroke uh, is um, kind of, again, a, a lay language for what we call a transient ischemic attack in medical terms. What does that mean? It means ischemic, again, interruption of blood flow is what that word denotes. Transient, so it was temporary, and an attack. It came yeah. and then it went. So you put those together, it means something happened to the blood flow in a blood vessel in a brain, interrupted brain function in that part of the brain, but happily it resolved itself. Great, we're all relieved. Mm -hmm. But that's a warning flag. I mean, something is up. Maybe you've got a blockage developing in the carotid artery here in the neck that's the source of so many strokes in America. Maybe you have an irregular heart rhythm. Irregular heart rhythms can cause little blood clots to form on the inside of the pumping chambers, and those can come free and lodge in a blood vessel, even though the blood vessel itself is healthy. Maybe you have a hole in your heart. Some people are born with holes between the left and right sides of the heart. We're all developing little tiny blood clots in our veins, mostly in our legs. That's normal. Our body has a way of taking care of that. But it requires that the blood flow normally and we don't get blood sneaking from the right side of the heart into the left side of the heart where one of those little blood clots can again go to the brain. So if you come in with a transient ischemic attack, yes, you need to go have a full evaluation and evaluate all the possible causes that could have caused that event mm -hmm. in order to assure you don't have that full-blown event. Great. Thank you for the question. What is the relationship between alcohol, stroke, and heart disease? Complicated. Um, there's a great uh, Greek uh, saying that uh, goes something like this. Um, wine, is it a food, a medicinal, or a toxin? It's all a matter of dose. Okay. And that seems to be true for not just wine, but all forms of alcohol. Um, here's broadly what we know. Alcohol in small doses um, incredibly improves heart and vascular health. It does that primarily by improving the way your body metabolizes fats and cholesterol. Small doses is the key. Yeah. Small doses is the key. And as you can imagine, this is this is a bit of a challenge for healthcare providers. You come in and see me in, in my office and I spend a half hour with you. I probably don't have full insight into what you, the risk of recommending alcohol right. will be to you. And uh, it's just an unfortunate truth in America that um, alcohol being an addictive compound um, can be misused. And if, you, if someone goes home and says, gee, I have the endorsement of my doctor to have a, a drink tonight, that might lead right. in the wrong direction. So uh, yes, alcohol can have those beneficial effects. 
in large amounts, of course, has uh, increases mortality for all causes, um, and very specifically triggers a number of different heart problems, um, atrial fibrillation, a kind of a, a well-known heart rhythm disorder with lots of consequences, is triggered by high doses of alcohol, and heart failure, believe it or not, can come about from um, at long-term exposure to high amounts of alcohol. Alcohol can have a direct toxic effect to the heart muscle itself and can cause irreversible heart failure. Yeah, thank you so much. We're at the top of the hour. I want to be respectful of your time and the audience, but um, maybe a couple of announcements before we close. We will have the next fireside chat that will occur in May to talk about COVID-19 and its lasting impact on the cardiovascular system. And also a reminder for those who are in Delaware, uh, we are going to be participating in the Wilmington Heart Walk that's scheduled for November 7th at 8 a.m. We'll send out a further note. DuPont was one of the top three sponsors last year for yeah, the companies around. Terrific. We're really proud of that. So really, Dr. Garrett, on behalf of everyone at DuPont, it's been an absolute delight to spend some time with you today to benefit from your knowledge. For those that are listening and watching today, thank you for investing this time. An investment in your health is the best investment you can make. Stay safe until we talk again. Thank you so much. Thanks all. Thanks, Randy. Yep, thank you.